Hey, we're going to start the book of Galatians. On t- the study here is called "What's So Amazing About Grace." I want to talk about grace for a moment. It's not the lady who lives down the street that you know. No, no, the grace that I'm talking about is related to the word "gift." It means unmerited, undeserved favor. Every now and then, you get a gift of some sort. It may be a birthday gift. It may be a Christmas gift. It could—I don't know what kind of gift you get. But uh, when you receive that gift from the person, if you were to reach into your wallet and you take out a dollar bill, and uh, the person were to accept it, all right, then that gift no longer became a gift; it became a bargain, right? Because you got this wonderful gift for a buck, all right? You got something really wonderful at dollar store prices. And you would go around bragging, "Look what I got for a dollar!" But grace means you get something absolutely free. Well, it's not absolutely free; it's absolutely free to you. But when it comes to God's grace, it's absolutely free to you. But that doesn't mean it's cheap, because it costs someone dearly. In fact, somebody has said the word grace is an acronym. And it, if you take each letter of the following phrase, it's it's like this: God's riches at Christ's expense. Jesus Christ paid for the gift of forgiveness, pardon, peace, our salvation. He he paid for eternal life. He paid for the abundant life we have right now. He paid for it with his life, and it's just a free. Gift given to you—that's grace. And we're going to talk about what's so amazing about grace. But before we do, I want you to meet the messenger of the book of Galatians. I'm not exactly sure what the apostle Paul looked like, so every time I usually pull up a different kind of character for him. But uh, you know, tradition tells us that he was short, uh, that he had dark hair, and he had one continuous eyebrow. And so none of the none of the artists uh, depict him that way. But I don't know what Paul looked like. But Paul is an apostle, which means he is somebody that was sent with a mission. He's been sent on a mission, and so the apostle Paul, he's sent not from men nor men, nor by man. What he's saying is because there's a problem, people are not accepting his his authority as an apostle. And so he's saying, listen, it, that's not. I'm not here because somebody, you know, higher up in the denomination sent me to you. He said, "But Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, that's who sent me, and all the brothers with me." I don't know who all the brothers were. It depends where he was writing this at while he was on his missionary journeys. That he writes, he writes the the letter, and uh, who's ever with him at that time. So he's saying, "What I'm writing is backed up by the people who are with me," and then he says to the churches in Galatia. Now I put、uh, the region of Galatia on the map there. I hope you can see it. It's in that region of Turkey. It looks a little brown spot on there, a little bit of green around it. And、uh, the people who are from Galatia were originally from a place called Gaul, and you can see the, the section of Gaul. Gaul is now modern France. The people there had migrated a couple centuries before, and so we get instead of calling them Gaul, they're called Galatians. Galatians, but they were migrants. They were immigrants. Now I want to tell you something. Immigration is not a new issue. Immigration has been around forever. I mean, who here is a Native American? Please raise your hand. We got a Native American. All right, <laughs> one Native American. The rest of us are all immigrants. You see, the Bible is so relevant. It's not an old book. He's writing to people who had migrated to this location and settled down in a region called. Galatia. Let me focus a little bit more on that. I've, I've got a yellow dot up there. Actually, it looks a little green up there.、Uh, that's Tarsus. That's where Paul is from. On his first and second missionary journey, Paul went to places called Antioch, Iconia, Lystra, and Derbe. On his first missionary journey, remember at the one place where he went and he was preaching the gospel, and、uh, they thought that he and his partner Barnabas that they were Zeus. And they wanted to sacrifice to him, and he said no. And so they stoned him and drug him out of town and left him for dead. Whew, what a missionary journey that was! 
Yet, every place he goes, Paul winds up planting a church. And now there's a church established there, and he goes back, this is the second missionary journey. So Galatians is actually a letter written to the people in this region, Antioch, Iconia, Lystra, Derby, who were originally French people, Gaul, had migrated there, and the Apostle Paul is a Hebrew Jewish guy, a Hebrew a Jewish boy, and, and he's taking the message to the Gentiles in that region. The theme of this book is amazing. Amazing grace. We even know a song by that title, right? Amazing grace. When there's amazing grace, when, when, when grace is amazing, it's got a cousin. It always hangs out with it. It's called peace. When you experience the grace of God, there is a peace that overwhelms your soul. And he says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember that, that grace is a gift that is undeserved, unmerited, absolutely, totally free. So much so that in Romans chapter 11, verse 5 and 6, it says there, if it is of works, it can no longer be of grace. And if it's of grace, it can no longer be of works. You cannot earn the grace of God. Sometimes people say, well, you know, I can't go to church because I'm not good enough. I have to clean up my act before I can go to church. No, God accepts us just as we are. If I could add anything to God's grace, then I would be my own Savior. And if I were my own Savior, I would be calling God a liar because he said Jesus Christ alone is the Savior of the world. You see how that works? Absolutely free gift. So what's so amazing about grace? Today I want to give you five things I think is amazing about grace. Grace has a mission, and the mission is to rescue us. He continues on in that third verse and says, the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue. The word rescue also means to save. Every now and then you'll ask somebody, are they saved? What you're saying is, have you been rescued? It also means to deliver. Have you been delivered? And so there's sometimes we talk about salvation, we talk about deliverance, we talk about being rescued. The mission of God's grace is to rescue us, to rescue us. There's an old hymn, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, right? I was sinking deep in sin, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters rescued me. Now safe am I. Love rescued me. Christ rescued me. Nope. Grace rescues me. You see, God it tells us here that he rescues us uh, by a substitute. He, God gave his son, Jesus Christ, as a substitute for our sins. That's why I don't have to do anything to get God's grace. Jesus has already done it all. He took my place. Right there it says he gave himself for our sins. He was an offering to take our place. And right out of the very beginning of this book, he's trying to say, tell us, listen, don't try to add anything to the salvation that's in Jesus Christ. He was our substitute. And then he says he was our substitute and deliverer, our rescuer from from our past guilt. The Bible says all have sinned, so we're all guilty. And uh, if we started to list all the things the Bible says are a sin, or we would find that there's rebellion and there's disobedience. And then there's things called sins of omission. When I know I should do something and I don't do it, to him it is sin, it says in the Bible. You're driving down the road. You see somebody stranded on the side. You think, oh, I should stop and help him. And then you say, ah, but what if it's a trap? And I don't. And I just cruise along. You know, it's a little easier now. You pick out your phone, you dial 911, and you say, hey, there's a stranded person on the road at mile marker, such and such, and they will go and help them. But you don't even do that. To him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Listen, all of us have things in the past. We have, we have things in the past that we want to forget. We, we know we've blown it. And that's what he does. He rescues us from our past, but he also rescues us from our future penalty. We live in a politically correct culture today, and it's not politically correct to talk about judgment. 
condemnation, consequences for our sins. But when I read the Bible and I get towards the end, it says, death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. We're saved from that future penalty when we accept Jesus as our Savior. I will never, ever be condemned by his grace, by his grace. But the text here is focusing on this, from this present evil age. Um, would you say that this age is evil? Has anybody watched the news lately? <laughs> Is there any good news on the news? There is so much bad news that they never report the good news. Isn't that right? I mean, there's good things happening every day. But we live in such an evil age that it's like, what, what worse thing can I report on than that was reported on before to get an audience to listen to me because people gravitate towards darkness rather than light? He has rescues he rescues us from the present evil world even though i live in an evil world i don't have to live like the evil people around me he rescues me that's what he's in the business of it's the mission of grace to rescue us from the present evil age and it's all according to the will of god you you realize this it's god's will that grace would intrude into your life and that God would give you blessings you do not deserve. Isn't he an awesome God? Isn't that amazing grace? That's amazing grace. It's amazing grace. The second thing that's so amazing about grace is the message itself. The message is called the gospel. I got it highlighted there. The gospel means good news. As I've already mentioned, our world is full of bad news. It's full of bad news. Some people get all hung up on our <coughs> Christian faith. They say, oh, you're so negative. You always talk about sin and judgment. And you're talking about things you do wrong, and you make me feel guilty. And, and they say, <coughs> what's good about that? Well, here, here, here's the thing. Imagine for a moment that uh, you have an allergy to bee stings, right? I don't know, maybe somebody here does. But yours are fatal. You're fatal, all right? And that's bad news. Just imagine, you got an allergy to bee stings, it's fatal, because there's a lot of bees buzzing around at this time of year. Did you ever notice? I I've seen the bees coming out, all right? And so you you're <clears throat> you've got this allergy to bee sting, and that that's bad news. But here's the good news. All right, the good news is there's an antidote. Now, doesn't that make you feel better? You see, the bad news, the good news is only made better by the bad news. Now, <clears throat> for example, you've got this allergy. All of a sudden, you get stung. Now your bad news has gotten worse. And all of a sudden, the good news of having an antidote just got even better, right? Because as they rush you to the hospital, and they take and they give you an injection, <clears throat> and as they're injecting it into you, what if you get there and they say, oh, we don't have any antidote. Your good news is even, that bad news has even got worse. But the, the good news is that they have it. And then when you receive the antidote, you've got the, the best news ever that there ever was. And, and you see, here's the thing. All the bad news that we give in the Bible the antidote is the grace of God. And when the grace of God is received, when we get that grace of God in, injected into our lives, all that bad news, that makes the good news all that much better. All that much better. All that much better. He's writing in this book because... He's worried about his audience. They received the good news when God called them by his grace. I was eight years old when I heard God call me, and I accepted Jesus as my Savior. There was a gentleman that I had a privilege of leading to the Lord years ago who was in his 90s, in his 90s. And, and I was telling someone in the story the other day, he accepted Christ, and then not too much later, he broke his hip and went into a nursing home. 
And everybody said, well, that's a fine mess. You lead him to the Lord, and then you break his hip. No, I didn't break his hip. He just had broken a hip. And in the nursing home, he, he finally said, I'd like to be baptized. And so he said, yeah, but I want to be baptized by immersion. Now, how am I going to get a 90-year-old guy with a broken hip out of the nursing home to the church, into the baptistry, and baptize them? And so it took us a lot of maneuvering, but we finally got them to sign off on with the power of attorney for him to get baptized at the nursing home. And we rolled him into the room that had the big tub. We got into the sling. We cranked the thing up. We swung it over. We cranked him down into the water of the tub until all that was sitting up was his head. And I baptized his head. And then we cranked him back out. And, and he became a member of the church. He got called in his 90s. The thief on the cross got called at the, the last moment. He couldn't even get baptized because baptize, baptism shows your expression of faith, but it is not your faith. Your faith is what's in your heart. You're called by the gospel. That's what God's grace calls you. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's the good news that you were called. Now, the bad news in the text is they were deserting. I am astonished, he said, that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ. They were turning and leaving. <clears throat> what has happened, and we're going to see in the next verse, is that there were people who were telling them they got it wrong. There's like a cult following where the gospel is gone and trying to trick and deceive the people so that it says here that you, <clears throat> you are deserting the one who called you by his grace and are turning to a different gospel. The word turning to is really turning around. You're going the wrong way. Here they were <clears throat> receiving the gift of God, living for the Lord, loving him with all their heart, and all of a sudden somebody comes around trying to turn them away and steer them in another direction. That's the bad news. But the good news is the gospel. The gospel. You accept the Lord Jesus Christ by faith alone because it's the grace of God and the grace of God alone that saves you. Isn't that amazing? That's what's so amazing about grace. It's the reality. Reality, there's a reality. The thing that's so amazing about the, the gospel, or the, the grace of God, is, is it's reality. It's true. He says, people are trying to turn them away to something which was really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion. The word throw into confusion is really, they're troubling you, they're agitating you. They're telling you something that just is not true. <clears throat> These people have been called by theologians, Judaizers. Judaizers. Because there was a following the Apostle Paul, wherever he would go, there were these people that came along and said, oh yeah, what Paul told you about accepting Jesus by the grace of God is true, but once you get saved, you got to keep the Mosaic law. You have to get circumcised. You've got you to keep the commandments. And all of a sudden, they turn it from a grace faith to a works faith. You've got to do something more to receive another blessing from God. Oh, sure, it took faith to get started, but now you've got to add to that your works. So they're throwing them into confusion. They're troubling them. And we see this from time to time. When I'm sharing my faith with somebody, I often ask them, if you're to die right now, do you know for sure if you go to be with God forever? And a person will say yes or no, or I don't know. <laughs> and then I do a qualifying question. Suppose you did die, and you stood before God, and God said to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say to God? Now, the answer to that tells me exactly what they're trying, they're believing in or trusting to get into heaven. And the thing that they tell me, number one, is that I keep the Ten Commandments. Right up there with that is, I've been baptized. Right up with that is, I'm a good person. My good will outweigh my bad. Wait a minute, all this stuff is Judaizer stuff. You got to keep, you got to do this, you got to perform. Do you realize only Christianity, only Christianity teaches that you are accepted by God by grace alone? Every other religion in the world tells you you got to make yourself better so that you can be acceptable by God, so you've got to do some good works. 
that you've got to do your good works. But the Bible says, all my righteousness, see, here's the scales, okay? And here's my guilt. Shh. I know that I've blown it. And what I'm going to do is all my righteousness, I'm going to try to outweigh this, all this guilt. And what do I do? I do the best I can. But God says, that's not good enough. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so I'm throwing out what Isaiah calls all these filthy rags. Filthy rags. All your righteousness are as filthy rags. And I'm telling God, oh yeah, accept my filthy rags to counter all the things I've done wrong. And now, how does that make sense? It doesn't. These people were agitating them, saying, no, you've got to make yourself better to be acceptable by God. And, and, and the grace of God is saying, God accepts you just as you are. And when you wrap your head around, God accepts me just as I am, I don't work to get saved or keep my salvation. I do all the things I do because I love the one who showed me the grace. I love you, Lord. I don't do this because I have to. I do this because I want to. I don't read my Bible because that's going to make me a better Christian. I don't get baptized because that's going to make me a better Christian. I don't, I don't do it. I do those because I love you, Lord. And if that's what you want me to do, Lord, I'll do that. Not because I got to, because Christ did everything. I'm saved by grace alone. I'm not going to let anybody trouble me and tell me that, and try to guilt me into being a better person so I somehow make myself better before God because Jesus, grace, is enough. It's all I need. All I need. He said what they're spreading is no gospel, not at all. They have perverted the gospel of Christ. Anytime you add anything to your salvation from Christ, you are perverting the gospel. It's all about what Jesus did, what I received, and my thank you back to him. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing grace. That's amazing grace. Its results are eternal to us. And the two verses are almost like a repeat. It's so important, he hits it twice. Eternally, eternally. And he's talking about eternally condemned. Who is eternally condemned? He says, if we are an angel from heaven. He says, even myself, Paul says, if we are an angel from heaven, preach a gospel other than which, what we preach to you and that you got saved by, let that person be eternally condemned. The Greek word is anathema, eternally cursed. As we've already said, so we say to you again, anybody is preaching a gospel other than what you have accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Listen, our gospel has eternal consequences. In the Gospel of John, it says, he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the, only, the name of the only begotten Son of God. The person who rejects the gospel or has a false gospel faces eternal condemnation. So we got to make sure we got the gospel right. That is for by grace, God's grace, it's a free gift, for by grace are you saved through your faith. It's not of yourself. You don't do it. Not of works, lest any man should boast. The results have eternal consequences. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Grace is amazing. The final one I want to look at is its approval. The approval. He said, am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Well, I want to tell you, I want the approval of, of God. And if I were to ask that question here, how many of you want to hear God say when you stand before him, well done, good and faithful servant? And, and I, say, I do, I do. I, everybody's saying, I do, I do, I do. Or he says, or am I looking for the approval of men? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be the servant of Christ. A preacher's job is pretty difficult. A preacher's job is basically to tell people, you're a sinner and you need a savior. People don't like the part where you say, you're a sinner. What's wrong with me? Well, well, well who, do, who do you think you are to judge me like that? I am just the messenger. That's what Paul's saying. Listen, my goal is not to make you happy. 
My goal is to make God happy. My goal is not to make you happy. My goal is for you to find salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ so that you can have eternal joy and happiness, forgiveness of sin. It is not my job to be a man pleaser. Every now and then, like the rich young ruler came to Jesus and then it says he went away very sorrowful because what Jesus said he had to do. Every now and then people go away and I feel bad about it, but I know that I'm not about pleasing that person. My life is about pleasing the true and living God. And that's the way it is to be for you. Here, listen. I think this is amazing that God one day will approve me by his grace, by his grace. So what's so amazing about grace? I've listed a few things. It's mission. It's to rescue us. It's message. It's to good news us. It's reality is to calm us. It's results are eternal to us. And it's approval it's to please God with us. Isn't that amazing? What's so amazing about grace? Oh, and did I mention it's absolutely free? It's absolutely free. The grace of God is absolutely free. Let's pray to the God of amazing grace. Father in heaven, we thank you for your amazing grace. You gave us the gift of eternal life. You said it's in Jesus Christ our Lord. When we receive Jesus, we receive the grace of God. If a child at eight years old can do it as I did, or a gentleman in his 90s can do it, or a thief on the cross can do it, anyone here can call on you right now and say, Lord, I receive your grace. Save me, Lord. Help me to rely just on you, not on my works, but to just live a life to please you because I love you, not because I have to. So fill my heart with love for you, Lord. This I pray in Jesus' name, amen.